Welcome everybody into our uh, our program uh, this evening. Uh, just a uh, little kind of personal word about uh, Greg and uh, Deb. So, so I've been involved with the Historical Society um, uh, forever, ever. But I've never really been involved in the museum end of it until, and I'm just involved a little bit now, come showing up maybe for Saturdays and so forth. I never realized the work that went into it and how grateful we have to be for Greg and for Deb and all the wonderful work they're doing. And so we are, we are blessed by that. So I wanted to, before I introduce Greg, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, so anyway, our speaker tonight, as you know, is, uh, is uh, Greg White, born in New Hampshire. Um, according to your wife, uh, moved uh, to Syracuse. <laughs> and moved to Syracuse in the uh, 1960s. Uh, college, Oswego State College, where he graduated with his Bachelor's of Science or Arts. And he then went to um, work for uh, PNC Foods in Syracuse. Um, he and Deb were married in 1974. They have two children. Uh, moved to Vermont and then to Reading, Pennsylvania with uh, a, a food company. And then um, he resigned from that. Yes, he did. Yes. Uh, and he began his own company, and that we're going to hear about that a little yes. bit tonight because that's uh, uh, what uh, it's called the die cast and so forth. And a little, I recommended him to someone who wanted to get to, to, to sell some uh, model model uh, railroad cars and things like that, and just a wonderful job. And the person was so grateful for what he did. But anyway, so with that, I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, tonight Greg White. Oh, good evening. And I guess you could subtitle that the kid who never grew up. Um, you know, I had a real job and then I played with little cars like this for about 20 years as, as a business. And uh, then I retired to trains all over again. So <laughs> here I am. Um, Bear with me, this is the first PowerPoint thing I've done in over 25 years. Just, just, uh, oh no, I did one for the, for the, for the college a couple of years ago. Um, so let me just make sure. Um, so we're calling our thing tonight. Uh, can everybody see so far? Because we could pull this, the curtains if need be, but I think we're just dark enough. Maybe, okay. a little louder because you're on the mic. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I don't know if everybody's hearing you. Can, can you hear me over there or not? Okay. I'll try and face forward as much as I can here. But we're calling it uh, Lost Wonders in the Pines. And as an outsider coming to um, Hamilton, you know, I'm not, I haven't been here all our, all our lives by any means, as Bill indicated. We've only been here about six years. And what we were completely enthralled by the history of the area and what's out there. And um, as, a, uh, as a person who is interested in um, what, what has come and gone, and, and uh, then you start throwing uh, trains and, and cars into the mix, uh, I'm all on it. And so for most people in the, uh, in the organization, I'm kind of a broken record when anybody comes in and starts talking about either Amatol or AC Speedway. And uh, so I'm kind of, I'm gonna try and address both in one session here. Um, and I'll have to, I'll probably have to move along fairly quickly. So um, we'll start with this. And much of what I'm doing tonight, or much of the talk on Amatol, comes from a very uh, valuable, I might add, book that was published at the very beginning of 1919 by the Atlantic Loading Company, which was, a, uh, they were chartered out of the state of Maine, and they were the uh, people who contracted with the government, basically, to run Amatol. Um, and this book, and if you read through it, you'll see some of the slides here, there's over 150 pages here, but um, this book really, uh, you can tell very early on that it was written by the company to, to pat themselves on the back, if you will, um, for doing this incredible job um, 
in putting this place together in a matter of months. And literally, the, both of the, the common theme for both these things tonight is they were built in a matter of months and then gone almost, almost overnight uh, in, in the total scheme of things. So obviously the Great War was underway. And the, uh, um, so a plan was put together by the Atlantic Loading Company to, um, to produce, uh, as you'll see, about 14 or 15 different size shells and, and uh, munitions. Um, everything was very focused. Uh, each line was dedicated to something else with a little bit of crossover, just in case there was a problem. Um, but this was the, the plan that was presented uh, to, the, to the government, if you will, uh, for, for this. Um, all of the people involved in this, in this operation were very well seasoned, either financial people or production people. They were, they were very accomplished individuals who headed up the operation. Um, right in through the, uh, and I gotta do a little bit of cheat sheet because I can't even <laughs> read what's up there. Um, but it gets a little complicated here where both rail lines come through here. What is now the Pennsylvania is here and what we used to know as the, the Reading line uh, and, and they change names about every five years it seemed between the two of them. But in 1918, uh, they were both running parallel to Atlantic City and they both came in. You can see where this junction uh, comes into the plant and uh, right here, they could, uh, uh, they could come in if they were bringing in coal for the heating operation, they would bring it in here. It was a huge coal operation. Uh, if they were going into the plant, then they would, uh, delivering supplies, they could come all the way around on this, this, this loop of railroad. And um, almost all the buildings in this whole complex were served by rail sidings. There were 50, uh, 50 miles of railroad within this complex, okay? Now, um, for reference, for reference, the old highway patrol barracks is that little tiny little white dot right there in the lower, lower left-hand corner, okay? And um, that was the administration building, as you'll see, for the the plant operation. So that was the nerve center, that big building that is one of the last remnants of Amatol. And uh, so the trains would come in and go right, right by the administration building and they'd either be directed here or up into some of the, uh, um, there were some storage warehouses up in this area and uh, right up in here, these are, these are various warehouses. Oh no, excuse me. That's TNT, forget that. Uh, this other one, and I don't know what I'm doing wrong here, but I hate these things. Right here, there were some general warehouses. Um, but anyways, they would deliver the product and they would go into these various uh, production facilities and then the finished product ultimately would come out the other end and then uh, this is where um, the uh, ammonia, um, <laughs> the, uh, whatchamacallit, Ammonium nitrate was stored over here. Um, no small secret that it's kind of over on the edge in case it goes. And this is TNT right up in here. This is TNT storage. Look how far these buildings are separated, okay? Each one of those buildings could wipe Hamilton off the map if it blew up probably, okay, when it, when it was full. Um, the part of the operation was this is the town of Amatol. This is over in, um, in the Elwood area where the ball fields are. If you go to the back of those, uh, if you go to the back and to the left with a kind of sandy road, uh, people used to ride dirt bikes and stuff back there and still do probably, you'll run right into the center of, the, um, uh, of this complex, what used to be there, okay. Um, in fact, there's supposedly, I don't know if it's still there or not, but there was a concrete footing in the middle of the sand pit that was the water tower for the, for the town, okay? 
So that's the general, that's the general layout. Um, total acreage of the plant was 6,000 acres uh, or for, the, for the whole complex, I should say. The plant itself was about 2,550 acres, it says here, and the acreage of town was 350. Um, and they only, they cleared uh, 1,600 of the 25 for the plant. So there were a few trees that were still, still there in both places. You'll see as, as we come along a little further, um, <coughs> it's not completely uh, flat. Um, now here's where it gets really interesting. I mentioned before, there are 50 miles of railroads that service just Amatol between switching and <coughs> they ran a commuter railroad back and forth from the town to the plant on the half hour. And so they had 10 locomotives and 30 passenger cars <laughs> just to service the town, okay? The whole complex was envisioned to be operating with about 20,000 people. Now at the time, Hamilton, for instance, population was, was about 70, 7,500, it was about 7,000, okay? So this was three times the size, or could have been three si times the size of Hamilton. As it turns out, because the war ended relatively soon thereafter, um, the best estimate is probably around 10,000 people working there. Um, there, you know, it gets into all kinds of stuff here, you know, the length, the length of the fences, you know, how much, how much fence, there was a million seven hundred and fifty, uh, 750,000 gallons of water supply, there was 200 miles of, of lighting and wire, uh, power wire in the plant. Here's the biggie that really brings this thing home. There was over a thousand structures in this operation thousand okay um you know it, and, and now all you see is woods woods and foundations for the most part um you know there were between guard houses sentry boxes searchlights there was 130 of those um there were 642 plant structures these are in the manufacturing area that were devoted uh, uh just to that cause Town structures, there were 465, and loading buildings, uh, 122. So actually, if, if you add the, uh, uh, you know, if you add those up, there's your, there's your uh, 11, 1107, the rest are kind of subcategories of those. Um, so you get the picture, this thing was huge. Um, carrying on just a little bit, Dormitories and bunkhouses, there were 98 of them. 21 female dormitories were, were, in, this, uh, were in there. Um, there were all sorts of houses and all kinds of tents also. There's, there were many temporary places too. Um, and it just goes on and on. I think we'll probably cover it. The steel for buildings was 6,000 tons of steel that were used and the various other uh, um, um, 30 million uh, board feet of lumber. That's, that's not too shabby a number either. Okay, and this was all in response to the need for speed, if you will. And so this had to be done quick. And this, this company was actually formed from the ground up and they pulled this off. Um, land started to be cleared on March 4th 1918. I want to say 2018, but it was 1918. The town was created in within nine months, uh, they, and it wasn't completed, but it went as far as it was going, and I'll kind of illustrate that uh, a little bit later. Um, but when we get to the production side, things were happening a whole lot quicker. Now, I mentioned before, these are just mugshots of the various people um, involved. Uh, again, lots of financial and, and major business people from, from different walks of life uh, and, uh, and business. The, um, 
the directors, uh, you had people, engineering people, of course, were, were key in this whole thing. So there were many people with engineering backgrounds, uh, electric backgrounds here. Um, and you get down, you know, engineers and draftsmen, 47, field men, 65. Um, and then you got your clerical staffs and, and everybody else there um, just to manage this operation. And uh, then you get into the number of people involved in the operation. It's accountants and bookkeepers. There's 200 of them. If you don't get TNT when it when it's due in, you know, and you can't pay the bill, you know, you're in big trouble. So there's all kinds of uh, accountants and, and bookkeepers and and uh, not to mention purchasing agents and things like that to make it happen. Chauffeurs. This is a funny one. There's 95 chauffeurs. This is the beginning of the automobile. There's plenty of there's I think 550 horses on this place too. A lot, of, a lot of things were moved by horse still. Um, there were 500 guards, okay? Um, there were uh, 247 assistant cooks and kitchen help and 39 cooks. Um, it, it goes on and on like that. There were 30 housekeepers for what it's worth. But um, this, was a, this was, again, a, a major operation. Some of the buildings involved, this was the general offices of the, uh, uh, just to show some of the people involved with the, uh, the town administration. And then this is in front of the state, state police building, if you will, uh, for the plant administration on the right side and some interior shots. But uh, there was probably not an empty seat in the house there. It was so uh, full. Construction department. The construction department, um, at one time, there were 5,500 workmen involved with construction, putting this thing together so fast. And um, in addition to 1,600 enlisted men, they didn't have enough people. So they had enlisted men come and help out also. That was a whole camp unto itself. Um, production. I mentioned there's 14 or 50, and I was thinking it was, I was thinking it was 14, but now it looks like more than that. This is all, these are all the different um, ammunition and shell sizes that they produced. And um, this just gives the, you know, the, the weight of each one, like this 10 inch, 510 pounds per, per shell, okay? Um, and it, it goes from small to large. So uh, your 75 millimeter, uh, they used a lot of those over in, uh, over with the French guns there over in, uh, 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 in, on, in the front or in, in the theater. Those are only 12 pounds a piece, but that's still, that's still pretty big, okay. Um, and again, <laughs> some of these things could, could wipe out <laughs> considerable, they could, uh, just one of them alone, and they produced thousands, if not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these things. These are just some of the, the pictures. Uh, again, I'm, I have to kind of move along quickly, but this guy up um, up in the right, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. like this is 36, 36 or 30 inches tall, for instance. This one is similar in height. Uh, so these things sitting on a table, you know, a lot of them would be would be this this big uh, for the for the larger ones. And whoop, 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 you also had um, drop bombs and things like that that were coming out of here, and those were probably the, the 500 pound uh, uh, things, perhaps there. Um, yeah, it was a Mark II, which is in there somewhere. Uh, that's a Mark IV, but yeah, one of these big guys is the Mark II that that was listed as as 500. Um, and these are all the various uh, boosters and, and things that are all those little pieces in front. Those are all components that have to go into the making of these things. The, the explosives required just for a 24 hour workday, for a 24 hour period, um, they needed uh, just for that 175 millimeter, they needed 97,500 pounds of TNT. A day, a day, um, and it, it gets 
you know, you, you can see the capacity of the plant. They could put out 30,000 of those in one day, all by hand. Okay. Um, so um, these numbers are, are staggering. Um, by the end of the fighting of World War I, Amatol was producing 20% of the Allied munitions that were being used to end the war. So this little place down here in the woods was doing 20% of the total for all the Allies. Uh, the process, and I'm no technical person at all on this kind of thing, but let's we'll talk about this 75 millimeter thing. I'll take you a little more in depth there. But just to prepare one shell, you got to receive it, clean it, shellac it so it won't corrode and it'll it'll uh, hold up a little better. Pouring and the cooling, that's that's melting the TNT down and drilling and cleaning the building, obviously uh, 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 assembly, packing, shipping, empty box and container storage, cartridge case storage building, smokeless, you know, filling building, ammonium nitrate crushing and drying building, ammonium nitrate storage, obviously, TNT, smokeless storage, primer magazine and booster mag, all those things have to be done to, to pull off uh, making a more one shell over the course of uh, um, its production. Here are just some plant office buildings, again, drawing your attention to the administration building of the plant, being the, what we know as the State Police uh, Barracks building. There it was in its prime, and there's the dirt road that led into it at that time. All the roads in here were pretty much dirt or gravel. So this was, you know, before so many modern uh, things came along. Um, the 75 millimeter plant alone, this is just one little piece of that web of things. Uh, the, the, the materials would come in here, get offloaded. Um, there's an aluminum, uh, uh, ammonium nitrate would be unloaded there. And again, on the other side, this was receiving and cleaning of the, uh, uh, the shells and things coming in. And then everything kind of comes together as it goes down the line. Most of these lines were gravity-fed conveyors. Most of, the, most of the buildings had conveyors going through it that, um, so everything was kind of going, going along and uh, uh, with the ultimate goal of getting out to the loading dock to go into storage or to go directly out. Um, so I could dwell on this a lot, um, but it's a very complex thing, and that's just for one size of ammunition right there. Um, this is the 75 millimeter area. That's what you just saw, I think, probably in a very a rather early stage of production, but they were the first things to be produced, and um, they, um, in July, they were shipping, they were shipping shells, early July. Um, this just gets in. I'm going to skip through these fairly quickly, but there's the uh, uh, the four four point seven inch plant, a little smaller. This is the four point seven inch uh, plant area, and you will see throughout this anything in production. Most of these buildings were built with tapering sides that go out. Anybody who's been back in the woods. The six structures that are within the area of the, uh, the track right now, they all have those sloped sides. And then they typically used steel, steel uh, rather almost delicate as you see, rather uh, these preformed steel things that they could make a, a normal roof. And um, they didn't get, I didn't see a specific reference, but everybody said it was pretty much uh, what do you call the, the, the like aluminum uh, roofs, you know, the um, trusses. What? Trusses. trusses? No, the, the roof itself. Corrugated? Yeah, kind of like corrugated, yeah, whatever, whatever it's galvanized or whatever that's made out of. But the whole purpose of this was if there's an explosion, everything goes up, okay? 
Um, so that's why you have the thick bases on most of these buildings that are that are in in critical areas. Um, they would blow the roof to kingdom come, but the building would probably still stand and the people inside of it have uh, some degree of survivability uh, versus a, con a fully contained thing where you just, you know, like that if they're from the impact, from the concussion. Do you know if they ever had an explosion? They never had any serious accidents. The paper only reported uh, a couple of people hospitalized and it was nothing. Wow, they never crazy. had, and yet, uh, and I'm kind of getting off just things I've heard now, but um, I think it was about 10 years later, there was an act of sabotage on one of, on the New Jersey side, and somebody may know more about this, uh, please, please jump in. But anyway, somebody blew up a whole train load. It, you guys ought to know about that. <laughs> they blew up a train load of, um, munitions on the New Jersey side and it blew out windows in Brooklyn. Oh, oh my mm. God. Yeah, yeah. That, I've heard more than one direct reference to that oh particular, God. it was some, you know, and, and it was a train that, that they that they targeted. There was to. also a Chester, Pennsylvania loading plant yes. that ended up selling at the end of the war ammunition to the Bolshevik, you know, to the Bolshevik government funding the, uh, you know, the Mm -hmm. you know, the white Russians and all that. Mm -hmm. And that apparently was, they take an act of sabotage, that plant wow. completely went up. Yeah, wow. yeah. You know, if this thing, um, the destructive force that was sitting over here yeah. at any given time, mm -hmm. uh, if it had ever gone, and that's why you had 500 guards, that were guard, it was, little, it was like Hogan's Heroes. I mean, you had little guard shacks all, <laughs> all around. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they were there for a reason. Um, plus you had a civilian component also that kind of kept track of everything too, you know, the, the kind of a security type detail. Um, again, more, just more plants and more of this, this building, this building shape again. Now that's just a, you know, a, a packing building. There's nothing really too bad going on up in the upper right. Um, this is a magazine uh, for boosters here, uh, a service magazine for boosters, it says. And uh, so some, some buildings obviously were more susceptible. I didn't point out before, but I think we'll come across another slide. Six inch plant, same situation. Most of these buildings were 260 feet long, approximately, by 40, 45 feet. There was one that was, I, I, I read somewhere, there was one that was, that was 400 feet long. If you put all the buildings end to end in manufacturing, it was eight miles of buildings. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, you can see there's some, some conveyors uh, coming across between buildings. Um, here's what I'm talking about where most of these buildings, you could roll roll a boxcar right up next to it, open the doors there, probably put out a little ramp and right inside or, or coming back out if, it, if that be the case. Um, so everything was serviced. When you had two rows of buildings, typically the rails came down on the outside edges of those two buildings. Um, another plant, another uh, build, group of buildings. Now. A number of the buildings had these built around them eventually. And these were, um, they were filled with, I think they put sand or concrete, they put sand in them, they made this shell <coughs> on the outside and it was meant to reduce the, the, side, uh, the side forces if, if, you know, to keep things further contained, if you will. Here's one little room, look at all these shells right there. Okay. Um, and now this looks like a 400 foot building perhaps right here. And um, could be the same, it might be the same building in fact. Um, just massive. Um, this is hand grenades, hand grenade plant. Um, and then you had, uh, you did rifle grenades also. Uh, <coughs> so there were a couple different uh, forms of grenades being produced. 
in various places. This is the booster plant. Um, again, I'm, I'm not too technical on this, but the booster, I think, is one of the things that ignites the, the charge. I mean, did I say that in layman's terms correctly? I, I think um, one of the things that will ignite the, uh, the internal charge. Here's the rifle grenade uh, plant area. And there is, uh, there's that. Now you can see in that one, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of wooden, wooden that may just be scaffolding that's, that's up in this while it's being built. Um, but it's, this seems like a less, uh, a less robust building uh, that is being constructed there. Now, here's some of that, here's some of that metal, that metal work. When I say it's kind of delicate, there's no big, big heavy I-beams, you know, or whatever. Uh, everything is, is done so that, you know, it'll hold a lot of weight, even though there's not much mass to it, you know, because of the shape. Um, they, one of the reasons they did the steel was they knew this was gonna be a temporary thing. And when it was done, they wanted to have something they could melt down again. And they needed steel for all kinds of things anyway. So they went with a lot of this. And again, if it decided to blow, most, most of it went up, although, again, that one has the seal uh, quite a bit on the sides. Um, everybody okay so far? Am I, again, it's, it's a lot to cram in here. And uh, I want to get to uh, uh, the area where they're actually working on those 75 millimeter shells, for instance. Here's again, a couple of the rail sidings right next to the buildings. Uh, smaller buildings. This is smokeless powder storage magazines. Um, each magazine here stores enough smokeless powder to load 240,000 75 millimeter shells. And there's a whole line of them. <laughs> yeah. Just that little building there. It's not a big building at all. Uh, TNT storage. That was way over to the right in that big uh, master plan there. And again, they were separated out pretty good for obvious reasons. They were small buildings, um, as you can see right there. And again, they've got some of that, uh, you know, this, the shielding uh, in between there, and they were still separated by quite a bit, um, regardless uh, when they were finished. Um, this is miscellaneous storage. This was that one uh, wing or branch that went up in the uh, kind of in the middle of that shot this could be anything you know that they're that they're storing uh, uh, either loaded or unloaded uh, ready you know waiting for production um, for 60 days storage 13 and a quarter acre storage space are required there's 49 of these buildings were <laughs> contemplated so they weren't all completed here um, but bottom line is there was a ton of storage area that, that was um, was built. And those are some of those buildings. Again, that looks like a 400 footer there. That looks very long. <laughs> okay, uh, completed rounds, storage, once again, a different, you know, a different <laughs> building. These are all completed rounds. They're all ready to go. They've gotta be, uh, they've gotta be packed up and, and, and sent away at this point. Um, here's that. Here's the diagram of the steel that I was talking about. There's really not much to it, but all these little sections go together, and they were pretty much cookie cutter things so that they could use in pretty much standard uh, dimensions over and over and over again uh, in different configurated buildings. Um, these are these are just some of the, the those buildings. More storage. <coughs> Now, TNT, TNT can be very nasty. TNT can give you headaches. It can, I forget all of them now. Uh, it can give you headaches. It can um, give you stroke. And uh, what's the other thing? Um, anyways, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So we have here the men's dressing room, oh, men's dressing room, excuse me, and the ladies' dressing room building, whatever. When you come to work in the morning, you come in your civilian clothes. 
you go into the um, dressing buildings and you are confronted with all sorts of little little ropes hanging down from the ceiling. See all these things? And there's more of them over here too, a little, little harder to see. Um, the men took showers communally, I guess is the word. There were individual showers for the ladies here. Um, but you came in with your clothes and in the morning they'd be waiting a little bucket you were given a little tag when you walked in with a number on it. You took that tag, you put it on the little rope that was on that bucket, and the rope went all the way up to the top and came all the way back down. So you put your street clothes in there, <laughs> do one of these, and lo and behold, like magic, a clean work uniform would come down. Okay? And then at the end of the day, guess what? You took your other thing, the, number 968 or whatever, went and found that rope and pulled it down, got your clothes back, your dirty clothes went up, and by magic again in the morning, they'd be clean. So they, they cleaned them every night. If you took that, if you went home without doing that, um, obviously you had to shower when you're done, because even if you live like in a dormitory or something like that, with that TNT dust on you, anybody could get you know, could it, just about anybody around you would be affected. So you had to you had to uh, go through that procedure every day. Uh, loading a seventy-five millimeter shell. Now here's um, this is where it gets uh, gets tricky, and and I'm gonna fall on my face here. But the shells come in; they have to be. Um, you remove them from, you remove the shipping plug. There's a little, there's a little plug that's capped in the opening. And I think they recycled them. Uh, you know, I think they put them in a stack and I think they maybe used them again. I'm not sure. Uh, send them back or whatever. Then you had to go through and you had to wash all the casings. You had to clean them because there's packing oil on them, you know, machining oil, I should say. Then, um, this is preheating. You don't want to be fooling around with this stuff with a cold shell and putting, you're going to put molten TNT in it, okay? So you got to kind of get them, warm them up. And then right here, if you can look real close, there are little rubber cones that they would put on the, on the assembly line there. They would put these rubber cones into the shell. And then in another another area, another room, they'd be melting down, I think it's 800, 800 pounds of TNT at a time. They'd be going from a solid state to a liquid state. And then the little, the little TNT guys would come with little buckets of TNT and they'd pour into these things with the, with the funnels. And they'd fill them up essentially to the, towards, basically to the top of the funnel was the, the general rule and as they cooled and and as it solidified it would kind of come back down it would shrink if you will and um, then at the end they would knock that rubber cone off and they would take those cones and being rubber they probably just squeeze them or whatever and the TNT would fall out they melt that down and do the next batch with, with part of it um, so, but they had to cool at a very, then they went to the cooling, yeah, there's the cooling room. From, from that liquid state there, or when they poured that in, they'd bring them there and they'd gradually bring the temperature down, 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 down. If you did it too quick, they would crack. Um, the TNT would crack. And if you, the, the example that uh, Mark Maxwell used a few years ago was, if you then shot that out of a out of a cannon um, or whatever, just like the Harlem Globetrotters when they put the lead shot in the basketball, you know it's going to go. Boom, 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 you know it's not going to go straight. It's it's gonna it's gonna get out of whack and start start going off off thing. So it's very important that you bring that down and keep that keep that load very consistent. And there's we'll get into more consistency tests here. Um, then you get into, all right, we filled that thing up. 
Now we got to put a booster in it. So what do you got to do? You got to drill a hole in the TNT. You got to you got to auger down and pull more TNT powder out, and so that you can get the booster in. I think the booster. I, I don't think it it doesn't fill the full circumference of that hole. So I think the the hole that they drill I think is a smaller diameter in there. But anyways, they've got to drill it out. Then you have to remove the remove that TNT, um, and then this little guy over here, um, oh, he's putting the boosters in, that's right. Then, uh, oh, before, before he puts the booster in, these ladies here are gauging each of the shells. So they're putting a little thing in to make sure it's exactly three inches deep or whatever. And if it's, if it's short, short drilled, then you're not gonna get the booster all the way in because it's not gonna, not gonna wanna turn down. So they'd have to send those back if, if they weren't uh, correct. And then, um, then at the end, uh, zoning. This is where they weigh each and every shell to see if it's at spec weight. Let's just say it's supposed to be 50 pounds. And you have some that are 50 pounds, four ounces. Well, that's not gonna go as far as a 50, as a 50 pounder would. You know, that's going to be zone, zone whatever, meaning it's going to be a little bit shorter. So when you shoot it, don't expect it that the same distance as you would, you know, shoot a shoot a 50 pounder. Likewise, if it's short weight, you're going to overshoot your target. So all that has to be factored in, and they and they code the shells so that they know this. You know, if someone's really trying to zero in on something, they better use the same size shell to get there. You know, the same. Uh, the same zone uh, markings, otherwise they're gonna be sh just shooting all over. Um, the loading then, you, um, here's the cartons, they're, they're filling though, uh, do, 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 receiving, receiving cartridge cases, okay, those are just, you know, they're coming in, and then um, here they're putting in the primers, um, I should have said on that booster, before you can put that booster in, after you had drilled it, you've got to clean the threads so that they don't go in. So somebody has to clean those little threads um, before it went in. Then um, all the other, uh, um, again, I, this it's impossible to read even from where I'm standing, um, but they eventually pack it all up and uh, um, the, here they're checking the smokeless powder charge uh, for some of these things, uh, you know, before loading. Okay, um, the last, or one of the last, um, here is, um, I really, I'm really struggling here. Eventually we're getting, oh, here, you, you've got to put them in a tube before you ship them. That, so they're tubing them and packaging them all here. And then they roll down the conveyor and then they get, they get packed up. And uh, again, you see all the conveyor belts going uh, down, and, down and eventually out of the building for, for that. Um, so that, in a very confusing nutshell, is all the steps you gotta go through in just making one shell. From there, it just gets into, uh, uh, we get into the different shells. Um, this is just some of the equipment that is used. They use lathes, you know, this, this is like, um, you know, where you have a, a form and it goes in to drill out, uh, you know, to, to drill out some things uh, uh, or process types of machines for loading a shell. And uh, so there are some specialized equipment that gets used too. Here's one of those vats for TNT. That's what you melt it down in. Okay, and then they and then they feed the, the little pitchers. Here's here's the zoning thing. Here's where the scales for weighing those shells uh, before, and the rest are various. There's obviously a, a lathe uh, for for something. I can't read it, but uh, for turning down. Um, just more more uh, equipment. Here's just more interior shots of the lines. Look at all this here. Um, and 
need uh, concrete walls. They talk, they're, they're talking about them to contain part of things. Um, and this is just uh, ammonium nitrate in big barrels, <laughs> fertilizer or whatever, essentially. Um, so I'm gonna kind of skip through. There was a testing lab. Everybody know on, on Moss Mill Road, there's one thing that, that had my curiosity up and we finally visited it one day, kind of snuck in. There's a big concrete, there's a concrete structure about as big as maybe the two tables together, perhaps. And it tapers up and it's like, this was obviously something to do with Amatol or whatever. Well, there is, there's that and I think there's a right angle piece to it also. I didn't realize that was the that was the testing lab. <laughs> that was two sides. Two sides were were concrete, and two sides were uh, could take the hit, if you will, and blow out. So that's the remains of of this lab where you see uh, um, where you see some of these people working. Um, this is an experimental and testing lab. So it's it, it's really kind of bizarre what you what you learn over time now you have to feed all these people these are the um, plant restaurants and mess halls and these um, these were divided up throughout the uh, uh, throughout the camp and um, I will get I'll get to other ones um, fire protection there was a full full fire brigade on that map that you, the, the big map, there's little lines that, that go down in between all the buildings. And there were water lines and fire hydrants everywhere uh, to, in the event of fire throughout the whole complex. So, but they did have rolling, uh, rolling uh, uh, equipment also. Um, plant civilian guards, I don't, I don't really know how this works, if these were true civilians or not, but there was a whole, uh, uh, there were 500 people devoted to this function, uh, like you see along the top there. And um, not counting the assigned uh, uh, um, individuals to that were mil strictly military. Now this is the town. And uh, the town never was completely built, not even close. But all the buildings, all these little marks in black that you see here were all completed. So they're, they're kind of a few of them everywhere, okay? But they never, there's a bunch of them down here, and these are probably dormitories across the bottom. Um, and here's the, here's the woman's dorm there, that eight-shaped thing. And this was, I want to say this was the hospital. Um, they had more than one hospital, you know, they had other smaller hospitals too. Um, but that's where the foundations and ruins are over in, uh, in, in the town uh, off of uh, near Mullica. This are the typical street views. So again, there's a few trees, um, and, but you can see the development's a little sporadic. You know, there are open lots in a lot of these places. Um, this was a, uh, a panoramic view of the town. Again, um, you know, here's a bunch of dorms there and, and there. Uh, it gets a little bit sparse through here. This looks like the center, part of the center uh, square, if you will. Um, and uh, more, more panoramic views. Then here are the houses. Now these were actual houses that were there and they probably took pictures of every single one, I think. Um, but they look like pretty normal houses for most of them. These are workmen's houses here, multiple, uh, multiple dwellings. There were a lot of duplex type things, um, you know, two family things also, uh, a little bit of everything. And uh, this top bunch, you know, kind of almost cookie cutter uh, uh, style, these here obviously. That's K Street. Uh, most of them were, most of the streets were, were initials, I, I, as I recall. Um, there is one house 
We came across somebody a few, a few weeks ago that we didn't know about. There's somebody in uh, Elwood that grew up in an, in an Amatol house. He said it'd be hard to recognize right now. We went back and I'm not sure we found it, but in looking at some of these houses that look fairly normal, again, these are big ones again, but some of the early ones I just showed you, I could see where it might have been one of those. So, so there's, at last count, there's four or five buildings out there right now that, um, that, we, that we think, and I may be overstating that somewhat, but, um, but there, there's certainly more than, more than just uh, the one standing plus the one downtown plus this guy's house. Um, now, you wanna do some shopping? Go to Liberty Court. And all the all the stores and the post office and the bank and everything else is around Liberty Court. You notice that all these windows on all these all these storefronts, they're all this you know a larger panes at the bottom and a bunch of little little panes across the top. And you know the the front the, the fronts of most of these buildings are 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 done in that way. This back here from a distance, there's your theater. There were full facilities, the theater was built to hold 950 people, okay? Um, there was YMCA's, I think I, I, think I saw there's, there's four of those. There were swimming pools, there was all sorts of uh, uh, amenities or whatever or things. Here's those windows I talked about. There's, they all have that same, that same pattern to it in the shops. This is men's furnishings, there's a jewelry shop, uh, smoke, smoke shop. Um, and uh, these are, these were just a bunch of public, uh, a bunch of little shops there. And uh, so it was pretty, pretty uh, varied. There's the theater right in the middle. And um, again, here is the, um, they, I think they called it the vaudeville stage. Uh, where'd it go? It's from two different directions. That's from the stage looking back and this is looking to the stage. Anyone who has been in Taylor Hall, you were inside this building. Oh, okay. Taylor Hall. Where's that? That is the Masonic building in town in, in Hamilton. That building was reassembled from parts after it was torn down at Hamilton. They brought it back in parts. Would have been a would have been a heck of a move if it was still put together. Uh, obviously, it looks the same. It looks different from the front. You know, it's all closed off. Back in the day, there was a. This here is an open grill, if you will, or you could open it, um, but then the grill would be still the facade, and there was a huge organ behind yeah. that, so they could play the organ for the whole for the whole square for the whole town. Um, I don't know if the organ was in there when we when we were in the building. They gave us a nice little tour, uh, in in uh, Taylor Taylor Lodge. This is the downstairs. This is where the bar area is and everything. The stage, uh, that's still there. You could tell it was a stage. And the stairways going upstairs to the actual Masonic temple part, um, you could tell it's a theater. I mean, all the way, yeah. Um, who'd have thought, right? Um, that one of our people isn't here today, but this was her aunt. This tall lady with skinny legs right here, okay? That was Aunt Spindles. They called her Aunt Spindles. Uh, but for short, they called her Aunt Spins, okay? And um, then the, um, the little, this one, I don't know if it's this one or this one, but that's chubby. <laughs> everybody had a nickname, even, even the ladies back then. I mean, anybody in this town certainly knows that everybody carried a nickname, it seems. Um, so they're on the front steps of the theater back in the day. They, they worked at Amatol. And uh, she was only like 18 at the time and just got out of school. She played actually for the Egg Harbor uh, uh, ladies basketball, uh, you know, the, uh, the town team. She was five, 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 ten. I don't know if I said that, but yeah. This is town restaurants and um, and uh, mess halls. There's 18 places to eat in town. Okay. Um, and 
and this is the, I mean, there's the big cafeteria, uh, which we don't have the, oh, that's part, that's, that's the main entrance. That was designed to feed 6,000 people a day. Okay. I think it was actually, the, no, 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 no. 6,000 people an hour. So in other words, they could do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 6,000 people, and get them out to work. And <laughs> um, typical recreation facilities. Um, these are some of the uh, things I just meant. There were pool halls, uh, swimming pools. The one in the upper right is a swimming pool building. Um, this was a lounge and, and uh, some sort of pavilion in there. This was a billiard, a billiard, billiard hall. <laughs> Um, town warehouses, not too exciting, but mostly just to show again the size of some of these things. Um, you know, this is just for the, just on the town side. This could be bringing food in, you know, for, for the cooks, whatever. A lot of the buildings, the, the areas, let's say between the concrete and whatever is up there, uh, for the roof or whatever, a lot of it was done in this wire mesh with almost like a, a stucco type mixture. So it was, you know, it, it, I suppose if you ran into it, you'd probably, you'd probably crack it open, you know. I'm not sure how thick it was, but a lot of it was for the sake of time and, and for the sake of disposing of it later, was built out of this, um, this, this mesh like this. And uh, then, then this, this uh, you know, they, there's the wire, they put some wire stays here just to keep it keep it straight and then they put eventually they put a finish coat on it you know like plaster but there wasn't a, a wall underneath it as we would normally do in a, in a house even okay this is town administration building again that's just the the counterpart to the state police building um, just various offices and things women's dormitories probably the fanciest one in the whole place but anyways they, you know they they look like they had normal facilities uh, and nice they got rugs and stuff and at least in one of them for the photo um, men that was men's dormitory typical interior workmen's houses um, these would be some of the some of the houses look just just very normal to to the rest of us um, recreational activities again it shows the swimming pool the billiard hall is there, um, and then um, New Year's party in the girls, girl, women's dormitory, and this is the open house at the uh, at somebody's place. They're all dressed up, kind of goofy though. It looks like they got Santa hats on almost right there. <laughs> um, it's obviously a party. Preparation for food. Um, they could. Uh, various menu uh, single day of up to about I think it says 18,000 meals which would equate to that uh, 6,000 thing times times three so they had full full out uh, uh, butcher area and everything this is that this is that cafeteria for 6,000 look at all the tables so they just just crank them crank them through it was just amazing large that that would be and this when you look at this building here this this is just one of these so you know it goes beyond there's the center section and then you got another thing sticking out here so you're kind of you're kind of looking at it in this direction it's, it's massive um, got to have pigs uh, there was three yeah, 300 Hogs were there. They ate the garbage. They, you know, did all kinds of stuff and provided food too. Um, this is the town police department. They had, you know, regular civilian police, fire protection for the for the town. I think I jumped ahead a couple there, but um, Camp Doring. Camp Doring was 1,200 men were quartered during the uh, construction of the storage buildings, magazines, roads, and railroad. So you had 1,200 workers just, just there alone in Camp Doring. 
Magnolia Camp, which is near Magnolia um, area, that one was for um, uh, part of this camp. Yeah, this thing here um, was built so it could be torn down and then the and then all the quarters then what was left the solid buildings could be used then later for permanent quarters for the guards so everything kind of had a ultimate uh, goal in mind um, there's Camp Doring again this one Camp Alco they needed to get um, electrical connection 66,000 volt electrical connection so they hooked up with uh, uh, New Jersey Electric or, uh, at the time, and they had to put down 30 miles of underground cable. So this camp kind of moved, <laughs> kind of moved down the line to uh, to work on that uh, cable. Pro that's so therefore it's all all tents. That was the ultimate hookup. Was was the uh, uh, the station there? And substations, very typical, but. Uh, Two, two major areas there. Well, um, what do you do when you got railroad lines running all over the place? Well, to get from heat, heat from the steam plant, to get it from this building to that building or, or whatever, you gotta go up and over and back down again. So all these little little structures and, and this little, little uh, artful thing right there uh, got it done, but they had to go upwards with it to- uh, well, That's an expansion. Yeah, that too. That, because that, because yeah. of the great heat, yeah, yeah that would expand that, and that gave yeah. it enough room to yeah. move. That would that would allow it to uh, do its thing just fine. Yep. This was the coal again when you first came in. If you went to the right, past the uh, past the the, the uh, administration building, there was a very large coal field area there. There's a there's a plant. There's one of the trains with a couple gondolas there, coming through and a crane up there with a shovel on it. Um, there is the railroad, um, you know, there's there the, the engine house was a full size engine house. That was a good size one up on the right. Uh, you had, you had, you know, little switch engines and you had, uh, you know, more uh, with attached uh, or uh, separate tenders also for the bigger things too. Um, but that, um, these are guards arriving to uh, guard the TNT section uh, within the plant. They had trucks and, and things. They had a full full garage and thing. 75 trucks and 95 passenger cars. Um, and uh, but you also had 550 horses. Here's the garages for the 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 trucks around the around the facility. I think that's yeah that's the motor pool there. Uh, Side here. It was still the relatively early days for you know reliable automobiles. Whoops. Uh oh, I don't know what I did. Um, I oh yeah, there it is. There's your stables. Again, 550 horses, and they were actually uh, scattered. Some of them came up the road, I guess, up Whitehorse to go to work, and or either White Horse or, uh, or one of the other roads because they, were, they weren't all together. But um, there's camp stables at Camp Magnolia, for instance. So they were kind of spread around a bit to where they were needed. Water supply system, we touched on that a little bit, but uh, again, well over a million gallons of daily, daily water uh, was available. Um, full sewage. Full sewage treatment, uh, or sewage facility. Okay, um, complete at the time, I guess. <laughs> That's probably the best, best way to look at that. Medical department. Um, again, just showing some of the uh, some of the facilities there. There's a ward uh, up in that area. They didn't finish all the wards in the hospital, but they finished a, a number of them. In fact, there is the hospital, and uh, as I recall, these were done. And uh, there's female and male, got to separate people, right? And then there's a future ward there. So they didn't, they finished maybe two thirds of it. Um, military guards and police, 
once again, um, lots and lots, these are enlisted men. Um, the, the, the MPs regulated traffic, but this is strictly the guard, uh, or guarding the place was their function. <coughs> um, the first battalion camp, these were, um, these were the ones that were, these, these guys worked at the plant, the first battalion did. And uh, somewhere, uh, somewhere in, in the text or whatever, it's about 1,600 people there, I believe, 1,600 men. This was the second battalion, and they were, um, <laughs> they, I'm not sure what they did. <laughs> it says here, every uh, facility, okay. Um, I forget now. Oh, they did a lot of the mess hall stuff. That's right, yeah. 3,000 meals a day. Um, and then 3rd Battalion, um, they were, that was 3,800 enlisted men were stationed at Camp Amatol to assist in overcoming the shortage of civilian labor. So they were also put into, uh, they actually worked in the plant too. 